when that conversation about your early childhood sexual experiences first came out, I listened to it and I thought that there was tremendous trouble brewing there, you know, mm -hmm. uh, for a variety of reasons. And if you remember, I phoned you at that point and suggested that we had a conversation and we made some efforts to manage that that never came to fruition. Mm -hmm. And I always felt that that was unfortunate. And so I'd like to, if you don't mind, I'd like to ask you about that situation. Because, you know, I, I had a lot of mixed feelings about what you said, like many people. And they weren't particularly judgmental, by the way. I mean, so you, and you correct me if I'm wrong here, because I want to get this story straight. Mm -hmm. You related some experiences you had with a priest mm -hmm. who was twice your age, right? Something and, like that. Yeah, approximating, approximately that. You were about 14. I think he was a little older than that, actually. Okay, okay, he was a little older than it's that. It's difficult but... to judge ages when you are 14. I think, okay. I, thought, I think I thought that he was younger than he was at the time and subsequently found out he was perhaps 10 years older than I thought he was. It's difficult okay, okay. to so, age. But there was a, but, but so there was a significant age gap. age gap. Yeah, yeah. And, yes. and so arguably he was someone who was in a position of authority and mm -hmm. that what he did with you was something that he shouldn't have done. And also it's highly probable given the nature of such things that you were by no means his only, let's say, target. Mm -hmm. Now, when I heard you talk about that, the first thing that struck me about the way that you formulated it was your refusal to play victim. And I actually find well, I didn't that, see myself as one. I know, I know, I know that, I know that. And, and that actually struck me as rather admirable because you came forward and said, um, this is an uncomfortable truth, but you know, I was of sufficient age to have a mind of my own and this was something I was pursuing of my own volition. And then it is how I felt at the time. And right. you know, when you talk about the, the abuse of authority or whatever, I've never met an authority I recognize or respect. You know, people have to earn my respect. I have never encountered a person in a position of responsibility or authority who I have respected and, um, uh, and deferred to merely by virtue of their office or their position. Right. Um, so it's I just, also the a, fact I sort of constitutionally don't recognize authority. So it, that element of it did not strike me until someone told me. You know? Okay. Okay. Well, that's the thing. Okay. So, well, I can imagine that because I don't imagine that you were much different in some sense when you were 14 than you are now, you know, apart from obvious not maturation, <laughs> you're, you know, you're, you're a assertive and provocative person. And you're an iconoclast, and I can certainly see that that intrinsic respect for authority, which so oddly often characterizes conservatives, by the way, is quite absent in you. And so, and, and I thought, thing, isn't it? Because we have that, that's the that's the tabloid gadfly constantly taking pot shots at the. Uh, institutions that you also secretly love and are grateful for, but you are dedicated to keeping them on the ground and not, you know, it's the, it's the difference between, you know, the, the, the British tabloids, which love to torment our prime minister and the White House Correspondents' Dinner, where journalists are seeking to participate in that prestige mm -hmm. rather than um, bring these people down to earth and make sure they never go a full day taking themselves too seriously. Uh, so I, th I think that's a, perhaps a British, it's a bit of British, a bit of the British psyche. Working right, in. right. That, that seems, given my interactions with British journalists, that seems like a perfectly appropriate statement. Now, despite the fact that when I heard you speak about what happened to you and my admiration for your refusal to play innocent victim, I also had contradictory ideas that I think were more a function of my clinical training. And there were two of them that I'd like to discuss with you. I mean, the first is, you know, when you think about yourself as a 14 year old, you think about that 14 year old as, as yourself. You don't necessarily think about that 14 year old as a 14 year old. And mm -hmm. you know, when you remember your 14 year old self, and then you go out and you see some 14 year olds, it's actually quite a shock, or it can be quite a shock, because 14-year-olds are often a lot younger 
and a lot more clueless than, than you remember I, you. Yeah, than you remember yourself, yourself being. You know, yeah, and, I think I know where you're going with this, and I, and I, and I. Well, and so so. Go ahead, go ahead. Well, because the second part of what I thought was that, like, it, and and this is this the incredibly tricky part of this conversation, as far as I'm concerned. I mean, one of the other things that got you in real trouble, apart from the fact that you wouldn't name your the person that you interacted with, your abuser, so to speak. Mm -hmm. was that you made the unforgivable case, I think, publicly, that this sort of thing happened far more commonly than people were willing to admit. And I just, as soon as you said that, I thought, man, you're, you're dead in the water. Because it was interesting that watching... Be, yeah, go ahead. Well, true that may be, it's not something that can be publicly discussed. It's not... You know, and, 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 uh, I want I you to again to, tell. I, I went a bit further though than just okay. that. I, I took it. I took it a step further, even, and said that not only is this something that happens far more often than people are willing to admit, it is a function of gay life and gay right, right. Uh, uh, adolescence, blossoming, whatever. And um, it is a proper subject for humour, and I insist on it being a proper yeah, subject. Yeah. Well, I wasn't even going to bring those two things up because I thought that just you know that that merely bringing up the first part of that would cause enough trouble. But I'm glad that you did bring the <laughs> second part of that up. Well, because there's a serious conversation that has to be had about this, and the damn conversation hasn't happened. And I don't mean specifically about, even specifically about your particular experience, although I think it's a way into the conversation. It's like, the first question is, well, It'd be, it'd be interesting to take apart some of your claims, and I'd like to do that with your permission. And I don't expect this to be an easy conversation. No, that's, I so, wasn't expecting to be, so go ahead. Okay, okay. So the first thing I would say is that it isn't obvious to me that even if you were a willing participant in what happened to you when you were 14, that that justifies what happened to you on the part of the person with whom you were participating. Well, no, of course it doesn't. But the okay. way I apprehended it was that it was me. Right. And I rem but, but, and, and, and when I said a moment ago, I think I know where you're going with this. I can interject with a very small data point that I think explains how I think about this after some time and reflection, which is I have something now that I didn't have in 2017, which is a relationship with my stepson. And he is 16. And when I think, let's not, lead, let's, not, let's not finish that thought, but when I consider how old he is and put myself at that age, suddenly the horror that I see in everybody else's faces that I have never felt myself about what happened to me and therefore has never been, has never been communicated for me a sort of acknowledgement and awareness that this is not normal and that, the, that this is a horrifying and terrible thing to happen to, to a, a small person. I never apprehended it like that because I just thought of that 14 year old as me today. Right, right. Till, okay, and that's exactly what I picked. Look, that's exactly till, what I picked up from your, from your interview. Until the last two years. Okay, and now so I'm, and now I'm, I'm experiencing getting to know a child. Yeah. As a co-parent. Yeah. As a stepmom. And now I get it. Okay. So, <laughs> now, okay, now okay. Get it. All right. So, you know, I've seen this with my clinical clients, you know, who, who failed to notice in some important way that the person they were sometimes decades ago is not the person they are now. And the memories they have from those times, which are, appropriate to those times are not the same memories that are appropriate to those times now, given their relative maturation. I so think I that's fair. Thinking, and I think it took that, that change in my life circumstances for me to, to jolt me into realizing uh, exactly what you're saying. Um, okay. So let, so let me ask you some questions about that. It might be easy to just toss all of your discipline to the side for the summer, but a life of greatness doesn't happen by taking the easy route. The Hallow app offers an incredible range of guided meditations and prayers that are designed to help you deepen your spirituality and strengthen your connection to God. 
With Halo, you can embark on a journey of exploration, diving into different themes and types of prayer and meditation. From gratitude to forgiveness, each session offers a unique experience, sparking your curiosity and deepening your spiritual understanding. You can choose different lengths of meditation to fit your schedule, whether you have a few minutes or an hour. With its user-friendly interface and hundreds of guided meditations, the Halo app has quickly become a go-to resource for people seeking spiritual growth and healing. You can download the app for free at halo.com slash Jordan. It allows you to set prayer reminders and track your progress. Halo is truly transformative and it'll help you connect with your faith on a deeper level. Don't lose your prayer habits this summer. Maintain your peace and deepen your relationship with God. Download the Halo app today at halo.com slash Jordan for an exclusive three month trial. That's halo.com slash Jordan. What's changed in the way that you view what happened to you? And if you were interviewed, well, and I guess you are being interviewed about this right now. If you were being interviewed about what happened to you at age 14, I have two questions or three questions about that. Mm -hmm. What do you think of the propriety of that? How do you now view your role? Mm -hmm. What do you think about the culpability of the person that, that I would say, in common parlance, preyed upon you. How has that shifted? In the same way that there is, um, although it has been ruined by the progressives we both hate so much, um, a proper place for outrage. It is a necessary and right human instinct and emotion that has a place. There is also perhaps, much as it has been ruined by the progressives, a proper place for victimhood when you are in mm. fact actually a victim. Right. And I think that now I perhaps realize that I was one when I didn't know that I was one in 2017. Yeah, well, that's a hell of a thing for someone in your position to admit. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, it's, it's rough, man. And I, and I think that that's as concise and as true an answer as I can give you. Um, and I okay, think that's okay, so the let's, let's go into that a little bit. The answer because now I, I, I look at somebody I care about who is two years older even, um, and the thought of me at that age and someone taking advantage, suddenly I get it. I get it. I'm like, I would kill the guy. I would walk over there, I would shoot him in the head. Like, I get it now. You know? Okay, okay um, so that's, so that's a lot I different. That's a lot different. I didn't get it when I was... I didn't get it when all I had to go on was my memories of being me at the time. Yeah. Well, one of the things that struck me as so absolutely absurd about what happened to you in the aftermath of that interview was that I thought, okay, this is really, and it's exactly what I would have expected to happen to someone like you because you're so contradictory is that, is that you actually had a claim to victim status, which you then refused to capitalize on. <laughs> and then which people refused to bloody well recognize in the midst of the interview. Like the proper response to that interview should have been something like, well, here's someone who's talking about uh, a case of child sexual abuse, but hasn't realized or recognized that they were in fact victimized in that situation and hasn't come to terms with whatever that might mean. And this so then- This is not uncommon among people who have been through these experiences because I have since writing about this, I wrote a little bit about this in, the, uh, in, in, a, in a short book I wrote about the Pope recently. Um, and, and in the other things I've, I've, I've the, the brief mentions I, I've made of it since 2017, a lot of people have written to me with their own accounts. Mm -hmm. and this is not uncommon. I have no, discovered. I'm, no, uh, I'm not sure it's who not. Have, who have experienced this sort of thing. And I guess there's some point in middle age where the penny drops. <laughs> but yeah, um, I, I guess that, I guess, you know, there is, there is a right and proper place to acknowledge and understand that you were a victim of something. Again, I have to, another thing that upset people, I think, another thing that, that didn't do many favors, but look, I, I am someone who will always just speak it as I see it. And that will have terrible consequences and it will have great consequences. And, you know, and that calculus will change over the course of the next few decades. But um, I just, um, it wasn't the worst thing that ever happened to me. And people find that 
a terrible thing to come out of your mouth, but it just wasn't. It's not the worst thing that's ever happened to me. And so what's I the worst thing? Okay, so so I got a couple of comments on that. I mean, about 20 years ago, the American Psychological Association published a famous paper showing that most people who were sexually abused as children recovered with very little psychological damage. And right. that caused absolute outrage. The U.S. Congress, in fact, forced the APA, if I remember correctly, the American Psychological Association. This is one of those unsayable truths, isn't it? Mm. Well, they had to retract They had to retract the article, even though it you, was... If you imagine the sort of trauma that we're expected to recognize uh, that someone uh, says they experience because of mean words on the internet, and, and we, have this in, we have this economy based on um, what we all know is not true, but that you know, these trivial, frivolous things can cause some kind of actual trauma. For, for an organization like that, or for someone in public life to, to, to come out and say this huge thing actually didn't cause me that much trauma, mm -hmm. it sort of imperils the whole victimhood economy, doesn't it? Because if it's the case that many or even most people who experience this simply don't have their lives ruined and defined by it, that rather imperils the people who have made a career out of squawking victimhood for far, far less serious uh, experiences. Mm -hmm. And I think that's probably where well, the threat to the system kicked in. Where yeah, I, was, well, I, 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 think, I think that's true. I think it's also the case that the, the politicians, although also looking for a, you know, a cheap victory, moral victory in some sense, were also concerned that this was a potential uh, step towards justifying pedophilia on the basis of undermining the claims of its absolutely catastrophic consequences over decades. Whereas what I saw it was, was more as a testament to the fundamental resilience of human beings. Because right. Isn't, isn't that a positive thing? Isn't that wonderful news that there is, there, there are these extraordinarily evil people who do depraved things, but the chances are you'll be all right. You know, that something like this could happen to you or could happen to somebody you love or somebody you know, but that, you know what, chances are things will be okay. Mm -hmm. Now, every once in a while, somebody is just blown apart by it and you can never put them back together. But that's not most people. That's fabulous news. But good news is the sort of thing that our current political climate, the public square in America, especially hates. It's not so much whether it is, it, 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 it's, it's a particular kind of reaction to, for instance, um, people being, people being uh, uh, grateful and happy that capitalism is, is, you know, lifting millions of people out of poverty all over the world. People right. don't like that good news. Right. Because, right. Because, because much of what goes on in, in public life, basically the whole journalism industry, much of the entertainment industry, I mean, the, the, the whole of polite society, the whole of political, politically correct society depends upon everything being terrible, in peril, getting worse all the time. Um, the sort of shrieking, urgent hysteria of the press is made to look ridiculous when you point out, actually, the world's pretty great. Not that, pe not that many people go hungry. Uh, not that much bad stuff happens. The bad stuff that does happen, we're discovering all the time that human beings bounce back in ways that, you know, we never, never even imagined. Like, the world ain't that bloody bad. Uh, nobody wants to hear that, who has a vested interest. Yeah, well, or, in or if it, at least if it isn't, isn't it, at least it's nowhere near as bad as it once was, which is something. Or, know, as, bad as, or as bad as it profits the media to suggest that it is. As right. bad profits the academy to suggest that it is you know it, it, it these people these people have having having relinquished their primary functions whether it is you know speaking truth to power and um you know printing all the, the news that you know relaying the news that's fit to print or exploring the human condition human nature and you know building the you know expanding the you know the, the horizons and the and the sum total of human knowledge the, the, the media and the academy have given up on those missions and instead right. replaced them with an activism that depends on hysteria but also on urgency um on a sort of there's a, there's a sort of constant drumbeat and this is why you know it's always something new always something new always something new as soon as something might look like it's resolved something 
ever more hysterical and new must be produced.